Russell, good to see you again, and thank you very much for joining in today. Uh, you know, most people in the world seem to be quite worried about inflation returning and bond deals soaring. But you seem to have a different point of view that maybe the cookie will not crumble entirely like that. Maybe we'll have a growth scare rather than an inflation scare. Now, why do you why do you have that contrarian point of view? Yes, I, I do, and uh, you know I understand why people have that view, and it's very much based on a Phillips curve view of the world, which is a tightness of uh, of employment. Uh, there were two things I'd put forward as, as the contrary view. One is the supply of money, which is not a very uh, fashionable thing to look at these days. I mean, it comes and goes, uh, but it's growing at incredibly low rates globally. So, for instance, let's pick America, the, the doyen of the global economy. It's only growing at 3.7% year on year. There's only 16% of all quarters since World War II where the supply of money has been growing that slowly. And if we look across the world, whether even it's in India, much higher number, but at the low end of the range, China, we're close to record low growth in money supply. So I guess there's a, a simple question I ask people who are much more optimistic about inflation. I said, well, if you're expecting higher inflation, higher real growth, and higher asset prices, which I think is the consensus view, how come we've got close to record low global money supply growth? Something doesn't add up. So one of the, th the three variables that people are forecasting is likely to be wrong. It may not be inflation. It could be real economic activity. It could be asset prices. But it's difficult to see those other two adjusting without having some negative impact on inflation. The second one is just credit. Uh, when you have, and what we do have, is the highest level of debt to GDP ever in the history of the world. Uh, as we discovered with Lehman Brothers, you just need one significant mistake and the global financial system finds itself struggling. And as we know from Lehman Brothers, that's a deflationary rather than an inflationary adjustment. And uh, people who uh, watch me regularly on the internet will know that I will refer to Turkey as the next forthcoming significant uh, default in the global system, a 434 billion default on the, foreign f on the global financial system. I think that's big enough and to, to bring down growth expectations, to jar the financial system and to have people looking more at the decline of inflation rather than the rise of inflation. So you think that if an accident were has to happen this time, it would be a, a country accident like a Turkey and not a financial system kind of an accident? Yeah, it's a very good question because obviously, almost by definition, the word accident means it's very hard to predict. work out what, what, where, where it would be and predict it. But the thing, the thing about Turkey is it's a clear and present danger. It's obvious that you know, several of the largest companies in Turkey are simply not paying the debt. Uh, I do think it's a, a, a country. The BIS has also done some really interesting work with all this debt to GDP data, uh, looking at growth rates in debt to GDP relative to trend. And they've picked out over 10 countries that they think could have a credit crisis. So this is interesting because most of them are emerging markets. Actually, there are two developed world countries they pick out as having such a high rate of growth and credit that they could be dangerous, which are Switzerland and Canada. Uh, but everything else is an emerging market. So there is evidence, I mean, to the extent that we can ever be objective about an accident, that there are quite a lot of places due an accident because of just the sheer growth in credit we've seen since the GFC. How imminent would it be, though? Because these things can carry on for a long time, protracted period of time before they come to fruition. Uh, do you think it is really not at the door, or it can linger for much yeah. longer? Well, well, you don't have to tell me that they can take a long time to come to fruition, <laughs> because uh, I've been, uh, particularly in Turkey, I've been sort of saying for several years that it's, it's coming to pass. Uh, obviously, there are different stages of this, and what is the critical stage, the stage at which it's imminent? Well, it is simply when people stop paying interest on their debt, and that's where Turkey is now. And if the very largest companies in the country are really struggling, you can be sure that below that, the smaller companies are having real problems. Uh, the exacerbating factor, the thing that makes it more forecastable than usual, is that so much of the debt is in foreign currency. Uh, and we'll, we know from the United States or from Japan that you know, domestic currency debt can be sustained for a very long time. And I think it's almost impossible to forecast, based on a d domestic credit boom, uh, you know, just how vulnerable somewhere is. But the problem for Turkey and some other, particularly Eastern European countries, is the massive level of foreign currency debt they have and the falling exchange rates. So I think for those it's imminent. Uh, the interesting thing is what happens after that. In 1982 and 1997, when a major emerging market got itself into trouble, it changed capital flows for all emerging markets, perhaps unjustly. I mean, I think it really is unjust that emerging markets get lumped together, but it still happens. Their assets are still held in silos. Uh, and then we'd see a capital exodus from other emerging markets. And I wouldn't expect to find others being tipped over into, 
insolvency, but I wouldn't expect them to be us looking at generally much lower levels of growth. Uh, but it's very difficult to predict then just the extent of the capital outflow that ensues post-Turkey and just how much strain individual uh, markets will, will come under. Uh, but I am concerned, I mean, post-GFC, this is the biggest debt boom in emerging market history. And it is rare for all of that credit to be allocated. Keep the accident aside. Uh, are you seeing any signs from the biggest market, uh, the biggest economy, that things growth might be beginning to t roll over, and you will not get the kind of inflation scare that people are talking about? Uh, not particularly, and obviously, I think mainly here of the late 1990s, when actually U.S. growth was very good and inflation was coming down. Uh, you know, we always relate it. I say the, the view of the world is very much a Philip Kerr's view of the world that infl if uh, the jobs market is tight. If wage growth is better than better than bad, then that has to show up in inflation. In that particular occasion, in the late 1990s, America imported a lot of deflation, and the net effect was low inflation. So you can have reasonable growth without having rising inflation. I think that's clearly not the common view of where we are, but I think that's uh, still very possible. And I don't have to go through for people watching the massive technological changes that are happening in the world that are inherently deflationary uh, rather than inflationary. My, my concern in America really relates to financial markets more than growth, and that is what's happening in the Treasury market, where we have a fiscal deficit now running close to a trillion, which so effectively doubled over the past three years. We have a central bank which this year will sell $380 billion worth of securities, rising to $600 billion next year. And through my entire investment career, really the US government has been primarily funded by foreign and local central banks. And the central bankers don't have to sell anything to buy treasuries and fund the government. They print something. And we are now living in a world where central bankers are net sellers of treasuries. And therefore, it all has to be funded by savers. They could be Indian savers, by the way. They could be Japanese savers or German savers or American savers. But I worry about the level of the stock market in a world where we have to liquidate something to fund the government. I mean, that, that's it. Savers have two ways they can fund the US government. Save more, which is bad for growth or sell something else to buy treasuries. So I think the concern is not directly on US growth, but it's what might happen to other asset prices as they are liquidated to fund this huge supply of US treasuries. Do you see a problem with the US corporate bond market at all, given the way yields have moved? So if we talk about places where there has been excessive growth in credit, in aggregate, you can't point to the United States of America. I think everybody though, who covers financial markets realizes that there is a section of credit within America which is junk, which has once again been growing pretty quickly. Whether there's a significant enough catalyst to undermine cash flows to, to create quite a problem there, I think that's, we just have to wait and see. There's a significant boost to US cash flows going on through the cut in the tax rate. And the, that, that bit of the credit market that looks susceptible because it's just been, uh, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's, it's high risk credit, does have this advantage of lower tax rates. So I think on that one, the jury is out. I don't have a, f a very strong view on US high yielding credit. It seems like an accident waiting to happen, but I don't see the catalyst for it, for it happening. The problem I think is the, the discrepancy actually between that debt and emerging market debt. So we have a pretty significant sell off in emerging market debt. And really it's fairly moderate in American high yield debt. And I think that causes great problems for the world because the Federal Reserve, I think, is much, much more interested in its own high yield market than it is in emerging market debt. And I think twice in the last five years, the Fed has changed its monetary policy to help emerging markets. Once in the middle of the taper tantrum, when I think it was less aggressive than it otherwise would have been. And secondly, first quarter of 2016, when there was real distress in the commodities markets, I think the Fed backed away. And I think what's really, really important is this speech that Jay Powell made in Zurich uh, last Tuesday, where he said that the Fed did not believe it bore any responsibility for capital inflows and capital outflows out of emerging markets. So if we have this discrepancy with US high yields seemingly stable, uh, no issues with credit in America, but meanwhile, real credit issues building up in emerging markets. So that high yield debt market is really interesting. And it might sound like, well, if it begins to crack, we should be worried. But actually, if it begins to stay stable and doesn't crack, there's another reason to be worried, which is that Powell continues on his tightening track, regardless of the pain developing in selected emerging markets.
Mm. But what's the path of least resistance for the U.S. bond deal now? Do you, I mean, is it three and a half percent or two and a half percent? It is amusing to me that everyone's become an expert on the U.S. bond yield since it got through the magical number of three percent. Suddenly, everybody's grandmother is an expert on the U.S. bond market. <laughs> And when you begin with the price and forecast backwards, I'm always kind of wary about that. I mean, I'm not saying that uh, the fundamentals uh, always help you, but it is good to start with the fundamentals and then go to the price. So my view is that we're quite close to the peak on the U.S. bond yields, that it's an incredibly attractive level for many investors all over the planet, obviously mainly due to the incredibly low level of yields in Japan and, on, uh, and in the Eurozone, and therefore it will begin to attract investment. That obviously is helped by the view that I don't think inflation is a problem. So I think most people look at the, th uh, the 3% yield and think, well, it's just reflecting a tight labor market and the inevitable rise of inflation. So for that yield to peak and begin to come down again, I think we are going to have to see some data which makes people question their outlook for, for US inflation. Uh, or a credit event, and you know, in any credit event, there is a flock to the world's most liquid asset. And the United States Treasuries retain that position. Uh, we can go back through credit event after credit event, but if there's a sizable one anywhere in the world, treasury prices will be bid up, uh, not bid down. And the more we gear down our expectations for emerging market growth, then the more we, we look to lower inflation. So I think we're close to a peak. Uh, despite the numbers I've just given you for this excessively large supply of treasuries, and I think one of the reasons the dollar is going up is that foreigners are finding it very attractive. You know, if I tell you there's a country that's issuing a lot of debt, you might think, well, we'll have to sell U.S. equities to, uh, to buy all that debt. That's possible, but it's also possible that we sell German equities or Japanese bonds. And the fact that the dollar is going up does suggest quite a lot of capital coming into the U.S. and that that 3% yield is proving attractive, for, particularly for foreign investors. Mm -hmm.